Shepard. Uh, I'm a senior instructor here at the Institute for Ethics and Government. And we're very fortunate to be joined today by OGE's chief of the Ethics Law and Policy Branch, Seth Jaffe. And today we will be having a discussion about OGE's perspective on legal advisories and maybe getting some insight into how, when, where, and why OGE elects to uh, memorialize guidance in legal advisories. Uh, so I know Seth is very busy and we want to have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so Seth, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome uh, to the Institute for Ethics and Government, and we're, we're looking forward to your insights on this topic. Thanks, Patrick. Um, as Patrick said, um, my name is Seth Jaffe. I'm the Chief of the Ethics Law and Policy Branch here at OGE. And today we're going to cover when and how OGE decides to write a legal advisory, uh, what we're trying to accomplish when we write one, and for what purpose you as an ethics official can best use legal advisories based on the nature of the advice contained in an advisory. So when you use a legal advisory um, to give advice to employees, try to pay attention to the type of advice contained in the advisory because different advisories contain different types of advice. The advisory may set out generally permissive or cautionary or restrictive policy parameters in a topic area. The advisory might include guideposts or a factor analysis to consider when giving advice versus prescriptive determinations whose outcomes are determined by law or by policy. So before we dive right in, let me um, ask you to think to yourself. Think to yourself, when's the last time I've used a uh, legal advisory from OGE to help me do my job? Think, do I use these advisories, you know, uh, at least on a monthly basis? Do I use them every week or almost every day? I know when I do this presentation in person live, I see a lot of hands. I know that um, we issue guidance on topics that you deal with as an ethics official in your daily jobs, on financial disclosure, gifts, um, outside activities. And we know how important it is to have a well-written, clear advisory on these issues that you frequently encounter um, in your day-to-day -day jobs. And of course, this is true for a variety of reasons, um, including, of course, helping you provide accurate guidance to the employees who are asking you for advice. Um, but it also helps to provide assurances to the employee that you're giving accurate um, advice based on the applicable laws. And hopefully, if you're lucky, it might even provide some buy-in from the employee um, in the advice that you're providing. Now, fortunately, based on responses that we received to the annual questionnaire, the annual agency questionnaire, over 95% of ethics officials answered agree or strongly agree when asked whether legal advisories help them to do their jobs better. Now, although this is really good, um, there's always room for improvement. We're always trying to write legal advisories, taking into account real world scenarios that you all encounter in the field. And that is why for the past 10 years or so, OG has committed itself um, to among other things, circulating legal advisories to ethics officials for feedback prior to publication, having listening sessions on a variety of topics before we even put pen to paper, and reviewing ideas proposed by you all in the annual um, questionnaire. Even so, um, over a year ago, um, we reevaluated our legal advisory formulation process and came up with a new process in order to more systematically evaluate data generated by a variety of stakeholders, including ethics officials, and to produce more useful data-driven legal advisories on topics that are the most impactful. A couple of examples of recent advisories that we've that we've published um, pursuant to this um, new um, formulation process was the application of ethics rules to detailees that we put out this past July, as well as the updated um, application of the rules, the ethics rules to personal social media use. And we did that this past September. Now, the process of issuing a legal advisory is always fraught. Um, because it's tricky to provide helpful um, and timely guidance um, while appropriately taking into account 
the interests of a variety of stakeholders. Now, OG has to take into account the interests of a lot of stakeholders, such as employees, ethics officials, Congress, DOJ, nominees, and good government groups, just to name a few. And, you know, depending on the purpose, the topic area, the stakeholders affected, this will all impact whether and how um, we write a particular advisory. Um, specifically, it can impact whether the advisory contains more or less general policy guidance, um, prescriptive determinations, um, giving answers based on uh, law and policy, or just providing guideposts or a factored analysis um, for ethics officials to apply when giving advice to employees. So for the next 15 or 20 minutes, um, I will be briefly reviewing OG's current legal advisory formulation process, and then review a few legal advisories, pointing out when advice is meant to provide general policy considerations um, or guideposts where you all can um, use these guideposts or factor analysis um, when applying them in your own discretion, and when the legal advisories contain prescriptive advice with definitive answers to specific questions. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to talk about OGE's um, legal formulation process, legal advisory formulation process. Now, I just want to point out that there are many points in this process where you as an ethics official can suggest that OGE write a legal advisory on a particular topic. And as part of our process, that idea will automatically be reviewed by our attorneys on the legal advisory working group within OGE. So we have a very specific, long, detailed um, formulation process, which I will not um, go over in great detail or read to you today. But I do want to hit a couple of high points in the policy, purpose, objectives, and evaluation criteria um, for the next couple of minutes. So I think it'll be helpful for you to gain some insight into this. So first, the purpose. So the goal of the legal advisory formulation process is to ensure that the general counsel and legal policy division effectively and efficiently supports agency ethics programs by identifying and responding timely to the need for legal advisories based on the best available evidence. And ultimately the purpose is to promote participatory policy development that leverages OGE internal subject matter expertise um, while incorporating outside agency ethics officials' views and experiences, as well as advancing diversity, inclusivity, equity, and accessibility goals. Now, I just want to talk a minute about the procedures um, that go into um, the legal advisory formulation process. And the high level, they're pretty simple. Uh, we basically want to collect information, want to track the ideas and information that we have, and we want to evaluate the suggestions that we get um, in order to set priorities for writing advisories. And of course, we use internal and external stakeholder input. Specifically, um, first and foremost, we use the desk officer questions, the questions we get from agencies that are coming to OGE as a source of data and the, as an indicator for a need for an advisory. Also the annual questionnaire, and agency survey responses, program review data, um, also um, metrics from our website, frequently asked search terms on our website, as well as um, the legal advisories um, that have high or low traffic. We also um, glean information from the DAO meetings and other meetings that we have with ethics officials. Now, how do we evaluate the suggestions that we get? Well, that's also in some ways straightforward. It's actually outlined in our regulations at 5 CFR 2638.209B. Um, and there are generally five um, evaluation criteria. First, we try to figure out whether it's a unique problem that needs to be addressed that would have precedential value. Next, um, 
the potential number of employees that might be affected by the um, guidance. In addition, um, there is an important consideration of whether there's likely to be inconsistent application or implementation of a certain rule across agencies. Um, and also the interests of the executive branch ethics program as determined by OGE. So those are a lot of the considerations in the process um, kind of really boiled down to its essence for the types of things that we're considering and the types of information that we consider when we're trying to figure out um, whether a legal advisory is necessary and what it might say. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, yes, I think that's the next slide. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to talk about a few legal advisories today um, that I think are, you know, widely used, and we're going to try to consider um, the aims that OGE had in issuing these advisories and the types of advice that are contained in the advisories, um, so we can figure out, um, you know, the best ways to use them. Um, my screen, the slides are changing. Um, it's currently on the correct slide, um, but we'll see if it stays there. Um, so we're going to talk about um, briefly um, LA 14 08, which is the um, use of official title for outside positions. We'll also talk about advice that's in LA 1503, which is the personal social media legal advisory, the first one that was put out in 2015. And finally, we'll talk about um, 20-07, which is the Frequently Asked Questions Legal Advisory um, for crowdsourced fundraising. And these advisories, I think, are good examples of advisories that were issued because they um, implicated frequently occurring topics, emerging issues with precedential value. Um, they had a, a large effect on the executive branch and various stakeholders, and we did find that there was inconsistent application of some of the rules implicated in some of these advisories. Next slide, please. So to return to our theme, um, whether um, an advisory focuses on general policy guidance or provides guideposts or the totality of the circumstances analysis, or if it pr provides prescriptive answers provided by OGE, and of course, that's often dictated by the area of law involved. Now, of course, your use of a legal advisor will vary based on the topic and whether OGE's guidance is, as a result of that topic, more or less prescriptive or open-ended. So let's make this just a little bit more concrete and let's discuss some examples in a few of the advisories. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about examples of general policy statements contained in our advisories. And the general policy statements kind of set the field of play. They um, erect the parameters under which that you'll be answering questions, um, specific questions, but they don't necessarily answer any specific question. So let's talk about an example in um, personal social media advisory. So you see, you see on the screen here, I'll just read this specific example. As an initial matter, the standards of conduct do not prohibit executive branch employees from establishing and maintaining personal social media accounts. So that's a very general statement, but it kind of sets the field as being somewhat permissive. It's a little bit of a green light starting um, into this topic. As in any other context, however, employees must ensure that their social media activities comply with the standards of conduct and other applicable laws, including agency supplemental regulations and agency specific policies. OK, so that's a general policy statement. It doesn't answer any particular question, but it basically says, well, um, employees are allowed to have social media accounts, personal social media accounts, as long as they do it within the rules. Next slide, please. So another example of a general policy statement also from the same legal advisory. Employees' use of personal social media ordinarily will not create the impermissible appearance of government sanction or endorsement 
which would be prohibited under the misuse of position rules. OK, so again, this is a general policy statement. It's kind of a, a blinking green light at the beginning of an analysis. It sets the stage that basically says personal social media use will generally be perceived as personal. So that's a good starting point. It's a good frame of analysis to use when looking at a specific question, but it doesn't answer any particular question, but it's good to have your antenna, have your antenna up for these general policy statements. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here are a couple general policy statements from the crowdsource fundraising legal advisory. Uh, the purpose of this advisory is to assist ethics officials and employees in navigating the complex emerging ethics issues related to crowdsourced fundraising. So this is a general policy statement, but this isn't really blinking green so much as it's blinking yellow. It's saying it's complex. It's an emerging ethics issue, which really does seem to suggest that it might be difficult for employees to navigate without proper advice. The next statement. While crowdsourced fundraising is not strictly prohibited by the gift rules, the nature of this type of fundraising is complex and demands that extra care be taken to ensure that federal employees do not solicit or accept prohibited gifts. Again, this is a general policy statement, definitely blinking yellow here, caution. It's saying that it demands that extra care be taken, which is really, um, I think, uh, a nod to the idea that people are going to need advice in this area and that it would be a good idea for ethics officials to give advice early and often. In fact, it does say that later on in this advisory. So these are some examples of general policy statements that set the field of play as to whether or not, you know, this is something to particularly be concerned about or not. Um, but it doesn't, these don't answer any particular questions, but I think it's really good to pay attention to these kind of general policy pronouncements. Now, we'll talk about coming up soon, you know, guideposts, factor analysis that's a little bit more specific than the general policy statements. Often in topic areas where the outcome is based on impressions created or, or appearance concerns, like 502 reasonable person standard or the subpart G misuse issues, such as creating an appearance of government sanction, that will often lead to advice that is less definitive, and you'll need to use your discretion more often when giving the advice. Um, now, OGE gives the best guidance that we can, but in situations involving these gray areas, you will need to be comfortable applying um, these guideposts and factor tests based on your knowledge and your expertise related to your agency's mission, the employee's duties, and appearance concerns um, in order to provide the most accurate and timely advice that you can. Next slide, please. So, okay, so let's talk about some of the guidance that's provided where we have general guideposts or a factored analysis to be applied. So this is also um, the personal social media legal advisory. In evaluating whether a reference to an employee's official title or position on social media violates the standards of conduct, the agency ethics official must consider the totality of the circumstances to determine whether a reasonable person with knowledge of the relevant facts will conclude that the government sanctions or endorses the communication. So here, this is an appearance standard. It talks about totality of the circumstances. So obviously this is a strong clue that there's going to be a factor analysis. In fact, um, this advisory follows up with a factor analysis. It has five factors and two catch-all factors. But the point is, when you see that there's a factor analysis, it's always a fact-specific analysis, and it's very often not the answer will not be provided directly by OGE in the advisory. Um, it'll be giving you the tools to use for you to use your expertise and knowledge to be able to apply those factors to the facts that you have in front of you. Now, I will also note that Legal Advisory 1408, the use of title um, in relation to outside positions, is basically an advisory that's just one big long list of factors and examples. 
There are 10 factors there um, about whether your use of title, an employee's use of title in coordination with their outside positions might lead to a misuse of position problem. But really, those factors are best applied by you at the agency. Next slide, please. So let's talk about an example of the factor analysis in the um, crowdsourced fundraising advisory. Here it says a gift is given because of your official position. If it would not have been given, if you did not hold the status, authorities, or duties associated with your federal position. Whether a particular gift is given because of your official position is determined based on all relevant circumstances, including the content of your solicitation. So here, this uh, legal advisory is in a fre frequently asked questions format. And um, very often, the totality of the circumstances or a factor analysis, the answer very often might start with, it depends, or in some cases. Again, clues that there might not be a definitive answer and that you're likely have, going to have to apply certain factors without there being a, a, a prescriptive answer provided by OGE for every factual situation. Now, that's not to say that we won't try to indicate where possible which factors may be the most relevant, even if no one factor is determinative. So for example, in this legal, in the legal advisory, in the personal social media advisory, we say that a prominent disclaimer will usually be sufficient to dispel any confusion that the government endorses the personal social media content. In addition, in both the personal social media advisory and the um, use of title advisory, we indicate that any statements on personal social media or on an outside entity's website saying that the government employee's statements are made on behalf of the government or as a representative of the government, then it is likely to be reasonably construed as implying government sanction or endorsement. So again, bottom line, um, these are very fact-specific analyses. The factored analysis really will give you the clue that that's going to be the case. And as an agency ethics official, um, you'll very often have to use your knowledge and expertise to apply those factors. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a so, really uh, good point for, for people to consider. And uh, I know when we work with newer ethics officials, um, the idea that we don't live in a clockwork universe and that the ethics official is a vital element and decider in the process of making a determination about whether something is or is not going to be a problem uh, is really important. So I think uh, for those of you who are maybe new, considering whether a factored analysis is uh, in play in a given advisory is a signal to you that your judgment is going to play an important role in coming to a conclusion. And that's well and good because our ethics officials are closer to the work. They have a greater understanding of the players involved. I'm sorry, I really appreciate that distinction and I hope that's helpful to new people. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself, and I know because I tried. Um, so let's talk about some examples of more prescriptive answers provided in legal advisories. So just like the fact that there are topic areas that lend themselves to less definitive answers, there are topic areas that lend themselves to more prescriptive or definitive answers provided. Um, these often involve you know, either areas of ethics laws or regulation where there's little room for interpretation based on the language of the statute or the regulation, or when OGE has made a policy call determining what the answer is in a given area. Next slide, please. So examples of prescriptive guidance, and usually prescriptive guidance is based on statutory or regulatory language that we think is pretty clear um, or determinative in a particular um, fact scenario. So we can talk about this one on the screen here that is from the social media advisory. Um, it says, an employee is not considered to be seeking employment with any person or organization merely because the employee has posted a resume or similar summary of professional experience to the employee's personal social media account. So that's pretty definitive. So if you have an employee who posts a resume to something like LinkedIn, 
Um, this pretty much just says that is not seeking under subpart F. That's pretty definitive. Um, likewise, an employee is not considered to be seeking employment merely because a person or organization has viewed the employee's resume on that social media account. Again, so it takes it one step further in the factual scenario. Not only is it not considered seeking to post to a social media account your resume, it's not considered seeking if someone views it. So we think that these are, you know, outcomes that are pretty well determined by the law and by our regulation. So we're able to give a definitive answer um, in the guidance and it's pretty prescriptive. Um, next slide, please. So um, another example of um, prescriptive advice comes from the crowdsource fundraising advisory. Here the question is, are there financial disclosure requirements for crowdsource fundraising donations? And the answer is yes. If you are a financial disclosure filer, your annual report must include any gifts aggregating over the reporting threshold, currently $480, received from a single source during the reporting period. Again, a very specific answer to a specific question. And I will note that it is often the case that um, financial disclosure questions may lend themselves to prescriptive answers um, with you know, a definitive outcome. Um, next slide, please. Also from the crowdsource fundraising advisory, question is, may I use crowdsource fundraising to solicit in-office contributions for a fellow employee? Answer, generally no. You may not give a gift or solicit a contribution from another employee for a gift to an official superior. While there are certain exceptions, there are certain situations that qualify for the special and frequent occasion exception, such as a personal illness or family tragedy, the exception requires that the gift be voluntary and of a nominal amount. So here, there is a pretty strong answer, no. There are some exceptions to this general rule. I will note that the advisory goes on um, and concludes by in this area by saying that OGE advises against using crowdsourced platforms to solicit in-office contributions for a fellow employee. That's a best practice. It's based upon a policy recommendation um, on the risks of that happening and the risks of potential rule violations, but it may not be legally required to have a ban on that outright. So here, there's a pretty prescriptive answer that also leads into um, a pretty strong recommendation on practices based on risk that OGE um, is issuing. So, um, in conclusion, you know, it's not always easy to apply guidance contained in an OGE advisory. I know, because I've applied advice in OGE's advisories very often. But it's not always easy when you have a specific fact scenario and an employee standing in your office um, or writing you an email wanting that advice. However, by paying close attention to the nature of the guidance in the advisory, whether it's general policy guidance, whether it's guideposts for a factored analysis, or whether it's prescriptive advice, um, as well as paying attention to the best practices that are recommended in the advisories, hopefully you'll be in the best position to leverage your own knowledge, experience, and expertise when providing advice um, based upon reading uh, OGE legal advisory. So next slide, please. This is a very important slide. Um, hopefully people will have some questions or maybe they've submitted some in the chat or maybe Patrick has some questions he wants to ask, but hopefully there will be some questions. Thanks a lot.